as, as Philip was saying, I am a tech and culture reporter at The Atlantic. Um, so that means I basically write about a lot of um, sort of social media platforms and the ways people use them. Uh, so that includes things like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, <laughs> and Twitter. Oh, Snapchat and Twitter. Sorry. <laughs> Switch the, uh, the, the uh, order. Anyway, um, so a few of my recent headlines, uh, just to give you a picture of what I write about, are above. Um, so for instance, the Instagram aesthetic is over. Get yourself a, ne a nemesis, which is just about how people have these online rivals. Um, the hottest chat app for teens is Google Docs, um, <laughs> which was a story I wrote about the ways that people sort of were Teens were digital note passing in class uh, through Google Docs, and Momo is not trying to kill children. I don't know if you guys had Momo in this country, um, but she, it was this like terrifying figure that a lot of parents um, thought there uh, was telling their children to kill themselves through Facebook. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> um, I wrote about how that was a hoax, not true. Um, and yeah, so today I thought I'd just go share some sort of like big trends from my reporting, things that I'm noticing, um, you know, through lots of different stories. And um, I want to start with Instagram. So Instagram is, I would say, the most important and relevant social network for Gen Z. Um, Gen Z, uh, as you guys probably know, so your marketers, uh, for the most part, is um, sort of the generation after millennials. So a lot of teenagers, young adults, um, people like that. And so for younger users um, who you know, were born maybe between the years of 1998 and 2010, um, you know, Instagram is sort of like what Facebook was for millennials. It's where they go to have their default public identity. It's where they go to connect with friends um, and all of that. So first, I want to start by dispelling some, some sort of like stereotypes about Instagram. Um, and I'll point to this first story. Um, so a lot of people, whoops. A lot of people are probably uh, familiar with the quote unquote like Instagram aesthetic. Like when someone says Instagram to you, you probably think of this like very curated, um, you know, feed of aspirational content. We've got avocado toast, these Instagram museums of like the museum of ice cream and things like that, a perfectly staged latte, maybe a selfie in front of a pink wall. Um, and that, that's sort of not really how young people use Instagram anymore, um, particularly like young teenagers. Um, for them, uh, Instagram is really just a platform for expression. Um, so you can see some examples here of some really big um, Gen Z influencers and, and what their feeds look like. Um, so you've got, um, you know, I don't know, weird pictures outside a grocery store, uh, like cropped selfies of jeans, a bunch of iPhone mirror photos. Um, Emma Chamberlain on the bottom right, she is a really famous YouTuber with, I don't know, eight or nine million followers on Instagram. Um, so as you can see, this is not like what you would maybe think of when you think of Instagram. Um, and it's not the way that like, particularly a lot of like brands or people that are trying to market to these people use Instagram. So. Um, so how do young people use Instagram? Um, it's, for one, not about the photos. I mean, as you can see from some of those images I just showed you, they're not like, people aren't you know, taking an hour and a half and editing these photos in Adobe Lightroom or anything. It's very much real time. And it's more about using all of the other features of the app to kind of express themselves in new and unique ways. So first, I'll um, start by talking about the importance of like comments and memes. So here's some more uh, sort of like younger focused accounts, accounts run by teenagers. Um, although the bottom right is Lena Dunham, but um, it, you can see like the captions are really long, um, and uh, you know it's kind of more of just like a space to express yourself. So captions and comments are where um, super young users spend a huge amount of their time on Instagram. So it's not just about the visual nature of it. It's very much about um, chatting and commenting and expressing yourself through text. Um, so yeah, I mean, in one, in, in many accounts, especially big meme accounts that are run by young users, you can see, for instance, um, it's like the star account. Um, it just says, make friends in the comments. Tell something about yourself and reply to others. So it's really just providing a space um, for people to kind of like go and chat and connect. Um, 
Another thing, this is, this might remind you of the Instagram, the world record Instagram egg, which I don't know if you guys had that here, but it was this account that um, basically got more likes than uh, Kylie Jenner on an Instagram photo. And, um, but it was in the line of these um, many accounts like this that are run by teens where they just post the same photo every single day. And you might see an account like that and be like, why does this account that just posts the same photo of a toaster, for instance, every single day have you know, 500,000 followers? And it's because it's really about the comments in the community that's building beneath those photos. So the photo is an afterthought. You have to post a photo in order to post to the feed. Um, but you know, it's really about the comments and, and captions. Um, so for all of these you know, young people, Instagram really is a utility. It's not like you know, this like fun, random place where you I guess, go again to curate your image. It's, it's about connecting with friends, and it's almost you're us utilizing it as like a chat app. Um, so I just talked, I want to talk about some ways um, that Instagram is a utility for young people. Um, here is an example of an Instagram party account. Um, so for a lot of young users, you know, they're not going to go on Facebook events because they've never had a Facebook, and it's for old people. <laughs> um, they don't use like Evite. Um, you know, maybe they'd use a paperless post if it was like a graduation ceremony. But if you're just having like a party, you know, at your house on Thursday night, um, you might create something like this, which is a party account. So you basically make an account. You'll put the date of the party. Um, you know, you'll put some information, and then um, you know there's different norms around it. So people will request to follow. Maybe you'll follow everyone that's invited. You'll post information about the party on the feed, and it's really just it's like a little mini event hub. Um, another way that uh, young people are using Instagram is um, to connect with schoolmates. So um, you know, whereas Facebook basically was built for this purpose, uh, which is to connect you know with other people in your class, um, now younger users are doing that on Instagram. So for instance, um, for the upcoming uh, class of college university students, um, a lot of these pages have cropped up for different schools. So you'll see Virginia Tech class of 2023. And this is where people that are in that class can go submit their photo, you know, post, um, post a little bio about themselves, and make friends in the comments. Um, then we have niche memes. Um, so as you guys know, there's tons of memes all over Instagram, all over the internet. Um, and niche memes are a particular type of memes that, um, that really young users post on Instagram and almost use it as a little public diary. Um, so you can kind of see these, like they're, they're memes, but they're really just like very specific information um, about people's day. So you can really learn a lot about like the average life of a 13-year-old just by their niche meme account. It'll say like, you know, how school has been so far from me, like, you know, what you, what you did at gym class and like walking around a forest uh, while, while all my friends are, you know, 85% of the period or whatever. Um, so um, yeah, uh, another, another thing that, you know, young users do on Instagram is use it to express their identity and often very political opinions or their opinions about the news. So here's an example of um, what are called flop accounts, which are, you know, Instagram accounts where people go to just go post about their thoughts on things. So some of that stuff can be like, you know, political opinions, like for instance, reverse racism isn't real, which is this political opinion that this, you know, young 14 year old has. Uh, and some of it can be more, um, you know, takes on, on uh, gay marriage or takes on, um, you know, issues affecting young people sort of in their personal life. Um, and uh, another story I wrote recently was about how Instagram, because it is this place where it's everywhere, everyone goes to connect. Um, it's become kind of like the default contact list. Um, so it's also, you know, like what people give out at parties. So if you, you know, like meet someone new, instead of swapping your phone number, which feels really personal and weird, and there's no context around it, like, you're, you know, it's not like you can exchange phone numbers and see the person's name and, you know, a whole history of their life. Um, so for young users, they also tend to swap Instagram handles. Um, okay. So um, <laughs> another big thing that matters to young people is influencers. Um, at least in America, influencer culture is massive. Um, you know, younger users are highly engaged with, uh, you know, inf with uh, Instagrammers, with YouTubers that they follow. Um, and people always ask me, like, oh, are influencers like, this is, is this just a fad? Or like, I know in, mar you know in marketing, sometimes people did influencer campaigns and it didn't work out and they think, oh, you know, those people are overrated or they're just famous for taking selfies. Um, 
And I would, I would caution against that type of thinking, because especially for younger users, influencers are incredibly important, and they're really reshaping sort of the, the economy in lots of interesting ways. Um, so, I, you know, for instance, um, you know, young users are like buying into influencer culture and posting sponsored content as a summer job. Um, or, you know, making a living via becoming a, a micro-influencer on a lot of smaller apps. Um, this other story that I wrote was about um, how influencer culture has infiltrated sports and high school basketball and how, um, you know, some very promising young high school athletes have amassed millions of followers on Instagram and how that affects, um, you know, the recruiting process for universities. Um, and then the Instagram husband revolution, which is really just about how these female in, uh, Instagrammers are hiring their husbands uh, to kind of be business managers. Um, so yeah, I think people ha like that ha influencers have a lot of clout and power online, and they're worth taking seriously. Um, and so that brings me to my next point, um, which is what do these platforms owe creators? Um, so another big discussion I would say in culture when it comes to like digital culture, I guess, is what, um, what do these platforms like owe creators? Should they be paid? You know, should, should platforms like Instagram or whatever embrace these people? Um, and again, I would argue they are worth taking seriously. Um, for instance, I don't know if you guys remember the app Vine, RIP Vine, um, but it was this short form video app that for a while was really, really popular. And it ended up really kind of declining and going out of business um, after, well, kind of a myriad of things. But one big reason a lot of people left the app was because they couldn't make money there. Um, in fact, um, some of the top Vine creators, about 20 of the top people driving the most engagement on the app, met, tried to ask the platform to pay them. And when that didn't happen, they all left for YouTube. And after that, you know, the app died. Um, so I think that that is one example of um, sort of the power that these creators have over um, platforms and culture and their users, um, their followers, I would say. Um, another, for instance, is um, the Instagram meme union. So it might sound weird um, for Instagram memers to try to be unionizing, and it is definitely not an official um, union, but uh, in, in, a, in the form of it's not recognized by the, our, our government that um, governmental body that governs unions, um, but it's a group of about 10,000 um, meme creators on Instagram that have kind of collectively been negotiating with the platform, um, and now the platform has to kind of take them seriously and negotiate back. Um, and then I just wrote a couple examples down here of, um, you know, ways that these creators can be exploited. I mean, I think a lot of the thinking around influencers is like, these people are so entitled, you know, like they just post pictures all day, like what are they worth, you know? And so because people don't take them seriously, I think they also get exploited a lot. Um, and so I, you know, the, I just wrote some examples of how hackers have stolen their account. Um, sometimes brands don't pay them what they say they're gonna pay paid. Um, so my next slide was just to remind everybody to take these influencers seriously. Um, they are like, especially for young people, highly relevant. And if you, if you over-exploit these people or if you try to steal their work, um, you'll really end up angering that user base. Um, so that comes back to my final point, which is that it's so important to pay these creators. Um, I figure there's a lot of marketers here, and, and this is something that I really wish marketers would understand. Um, just from writing about this stuff every day, I see often how um, you know, a brand will find some person doing something really cool and interesting on the internet. Maybe it's just a regular teenager. Maybe it's a YouTuber that's not that famous yet. And they'll say, hmm, that's really inspiring. Like, I'm going to kind of take that idea for this ad campaign and not, like, recognize or credit that creator or a random teenager. And, you know, because of the nature of social media, that can result in a backlash campaign, um, at, which can be really bad. Or it can just kind of like anger this small niche community that can end up being relevant later. So I would say, uh, you know, if you see something cool on the internet or if you're getting inspiration from random teenagers, uh, they will expect to be paid or compensated in some way. Um, and so that's really important because these people are, you know, defining culture for this whole young generation. Um, so directly supporting those people that are sort of like these drivers of culture um, is, is really important. So. 
anyway, uh, that was a lot, but um, I hope I, hope I kind of like gave you guys a good overview of the stuff that I write about. Please get in touch with me anytime. Um, I'm on Instagram and Twitter at Taylor Lorenz, and this is my email, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh thank, gosh, you. thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Okay, so now I mean you're a specialist. I think you established yourself successfully here as a specialist for Gen Z and for the for the latest trend on these platforms. What's the core advice that you would give to avatars? I mean, respect influencers, but like I mean, if you like changed jobs and now moved into marketing and <laughs> came, let's say, um, in charge of some fashion brand or some maybe food brand, yeah. what would you do? I would say, um, like, this, this, the, I don't want to sound rude, but like, know your place as a brand. I think there was this tendency for brands to act as people, and you definitely want to be an authentic you know, brand for your audience, but you also want to recognize that, um, that you're a brand and you have power, for instance, like, you can pay people, or you can, you know, if, if you're working with young people, um, don't, yeah, don't take their work. It kind of goes back to that last point that I made. Um, but yeah, I think, I think also just like um, being open to things and being open to the way young people are, are using the internet is important. Um, I know it's hard because like you, you see some kind of like teens doing weird things online and I think a lot of that stuff gets written off. Um, so I would just say also to like take kids seriously and listen to what they have to say, like have that open dialogue. I, maybe I, 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 you jumped it really quickly, but I, I saw that you mentioned Google Docs as a yeah. platform. Okay. Can you say a little more, a few more things on Google Docs? I never heard Google Docs as a, as a, as a social media platform. <laughs> yeah, so um, it, it does sound a little counterintuitive. So at least in American schools, um, a lot of public schools rely on Google Docs um, for learning. So you know, the teacher will, for instance, um, you know, allow students in class to take notes on Google Docs, or they'll all be in one sort of like presentation on Google Docs. So kids with laptops in schools will spend a lot of time on Google Docs, um, and they're not supposed to be on their cell phones. So um, what they end up doing is Google Docs has a chat functionality. So kids will just chat all day in class there, or they'll chat by making comments on a shared Google Doc. And that's kind of like how people chat in class. Um, so I think it's, it sounds a little weird, but I think it's one, it speaks to um, the fact that like, people will want to communicate, and they kind of will use any means necessary. Um, and so you know, in this case, like in schools, you can't be on your phone, so they're relying on, on Google Docs. Um, so yeah, it, it's kind of like whatever, you know, whatever. C can you leverage that for marketing? No, right? <laughs> I think it would be interesting to think how, I mean, you could make like a shared Google Doc and just have it like, I, if I was a marketer, maybe, yeah, maybe you could make like a shared Google Doc and say like, teens, make, this looks like a class presentation, but you can actually comment or something. Uh, last question. From, from <laughs> I don't know you should be marketing to kids in their science class, though. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> last question from Meister before we move over to the bar, people sure. can also interact uh, with you. I, um, 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 I forgot what I wanted to know. <laughs> Damn. Uh, I know, I threw a lot of trends at people, so uh, I, I don't know if it was all clear, but um, I think, yeah, a, a core yeah. thing is that people will, people rely on Instagram for a lot now, and it's very important. Let, let's, 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 yeah. let's take a moment <laughs> and involve our friends here at the bar. Okay. Any questions from you guys? Yes, one question. I'm a big fan of your articles in The Atlantic, and my question is, uh, what is your method to, to uh, create these uh, unique insights? Are you the, the super user in all these networks, or have you big friends and community network, or what's uh, the secret sauce here? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I would say I... I am a super user in the sense that I spend a lot of time online, but I really think you can learn about everything that I write about just by spending time on the internet, like asking people questions. Um, I spend a lot of time on the Instagram Explore page. Um, if you guys are familiar, you know, when you go on Instagram, you'll be on your home, and then if you click one over, it'll show you things that are trending for you on the platform. Um, so I spend a lot of time there following meme accounts, following things I see on the internet, and um, just going to the comments being like, hey, I'm a journalist, like, what is this? Um, a lot of people are really excited when their stuff is noticed, so they are happy to tell you. Or like some other random person in the comments will be like, oh, this is what it is. Um, so yeah, I would say following, following interesting things and seeing who they follow and then following them is kind of how I find everything. I, I remember my question, but a question from you first. Yvonne. Um, how aware are younger users of content marketing? Of content marketing? Yes. 
How are younger users of The younger users, how aware are they of well, how uh, aware content are they? marketing? Extremely aware. I mean, I think a lot of really? these younger users, especially if they're influencers or even have a few thousand followers, um, are, I mean, they're creating branded content already for brands, or they're creating branded content um, just for free because they want brands to work with them. So they're very aware of the idea of like branded content and content marketing. Um, maybe not in the traditional sense of like articles, um, but they're creating branded videos for you know a local brand that they want to work with or whatever. So, uh, what's your point of view on TikTok? <laughs> yeah, TikTok is is exploding right now. Um, I don't know if you guys, I think they have it in Germany as well. TikTok? Yeah. Yeah, we have that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, ByteDance, which is the big Chinese conglomerate that owns TikTok, um, is spending a huge amount of money making the app grow. Um, but it's currently more than half a billion um, monthly users uh, worldwide. But I think that includes China. So it's, it's pretty massive, and it's, and it's only growing. So, yeah. <laughs> there are things happening in the background. I don't know, pay I'm attention like, to that. Going on? Right, no, no, nothing's right. going on. Nothing's going on. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about memes. Yes. I mean, I, I, I said this morning in my, in my presentation that, that memes are, the, are a huge thing in marketing. Do you, I mean, can you describe your observations on, on memes? Is that are brands leveraging memes more than ever, according to you? I mean, do you see that? And, and how are they doing that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, memes are really important. Ultimately, memes are just a way to visually communicate information. Um, so they can take like any form. Um, I would say that like, a, you know, a lot of people now are creating their own memes and more and more and more. So it used to be that just a few people would create memes and then everyone would kind of laugh at them and share them. And especially for younger users and pretty much most internet users, like memes are very participatory. So maybe you see that Game of Thrones meme and like you want to put your own spin on it or make your own joke about it. Um, so I think like memes are getting more participatory, and um, there's more creative tools to help people create memes. So um, you know you, there are more. You don't have to go on Photoshop anymore. There's lots of apps that are springing up allowing for that. Um, when it comes to brands, I would say brands make a lot of like cheesy memes uh, sometimes, and I would encourage brands to like partner with like memers or people that are you know experts in kind of creating stuff. That Th that's stuff knowledge to take to take home. Seriously, <laughs> I think that's something you can. Immediately take home, like use leverage memes and partner with memers. <laughs> I'm sure not many of you have heard that before. And pay them. That's valuable content. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I think it just reads as more authentic, and especially if people know that you know it, that that creator was compensated. I think it resonates. So, yeah. More questions here, memers. <laughs> have you ever partnered with a meme, Florian? We should have made a meme on stage or something. <laughs> Porter? I said we should have like made a meme on stage, or I should have had a meme. I don't know, done my presentation in memes. Any advertiser that you think is doing a good job at that, that people can maybe look at? And yeah. I mean, I, I said Balenciaga. Yeah, I mean, Netflix is, is like infiltrated meme culture. I mean, I think Netflix is a good example, though, of like they don't actually like, the, you don't, if to make a meme, you don't have to, like, you as a brand don't have to be creating like a visual meme. Like, you just have to make something that's memeable or funny. Um, or like so, you know, so cheesy that people want to meme about it. So, I mean, with Netflix, they have, They just make that make content that people want to you know talk about and make fun of. So I think like if you're thinking like how can I make my stuff memeable, it's really just making stuff that people connect with and want to talk about. Um, and for the most part, expression online takes the form of memes. So um, you know don't worry if you don't have a meme master in house, it's fine. <laughs> More questions here at the bar. Should I raise questions? Questions, Armin. Okay. Um You were talking about the, the dangers of Momo and, uh, and the things. For my 10-year-old daughter, any advice, anything I should warn her about that you... Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest threats online are not like random, you know, made-up figures trying to hack their Facebook. Um, it's really actually these platforms themselves like collecting, you know, um, collecting a lot of data, for instance, on your 10-year-old and maybe marketing her in a predatory way, like marketing to her in a predatory way. Or I would say like extremism. I mean, we, I, I didn't get into it um, really very much, but you know, there are a lot of like dark corners of the internet that you don't want your 10-year-old to go. So I think it's like teaching them media literacy. I think parents can never know like every place that their kid is online. So you really have to teach them how to um, identify misinformation or bad stuff just so they don't go down those paths. <laughs> um, further questions? I think I have um, 
maybe maybe one last question. There's yeah. there's there's talk that at some point maybe Instagram is going to remove the counts, the like counts, yes. the engagement counts um, below the post. Is that would that be a good thing or a bad thing according to you? Well, I think I mean I think it's just in line with this trend, which I hopefully <laughs> was trying to make clear, which is that like Instagram is not just like a visual platform for likes. Like, first of all, when it, by the way, when Instagram removes the like count, it's, they're just removing it publicly. So you'll privately still be able to see, you know, how many likes you get on something. But it won't be, it'll, it'll take away some of that performative aspect. Um, and, you know, it, it's really, I mean, I think that people won't notice it as much as they think. For instance, the fastest growing feature and the biggest feature um, in Instagram is Instagram stories. And on Instagram stories, there are no public, you know, view counts. So only you know how many people viewed and engaged with your Instagram story already. So when they take away likes, I think it'll really just feel to most users like stories. And again, Instagram is such a rich social app. There's so many new features um, that, that it's, yeah, likes are already kind of going by the wayside. So. Thank you very much yeah, for coming here, Taylor. Thank you, Taylor. So thank you very much, much. for thank being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. <laughs>